Chapter Seventeen and Eighteen of Don Quixote, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader. Don Quixote, Volume Two, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby. Chapter Seventeen wherein is shown the furthest and highest point which the unexampled courage of Don Quixote reached or could reach, together with the happily achieved adventure of the lions. The history tells that when Don Quixote called out to Sancho to bring him his helmet, Sancho was buying some curds the shepherds agreed to sell him, and flurried by the great haste his master was in, did not know what to do with them or what to carry them in. So, not to lose them, for he had already paid for them, he thought it best to throw them into his master's helmet, and, acting on this bright idea, he went to see what his master wanted with him. He, as he approached, exclaimed to him, "'Give me that helmet, my friend, for either I know little of adventures, or what I observe yonder is one that will, and does, call upon me to arm myself.' He of the green gaban, on hearing this, looked in all directions, but could perceive nothing except a cart coming towards them with two or three small flags, which led him to conclude it must be carrying treasure of the king's, and he said so to Don Quixote. He, however, would not believe him, being always persuaded and convinced that all that happened to him must be adventures and still more adventures. So he replied to the gentleman, He who is prepared has his battle half fought. Nothing is lost by my preparing myself, for I know by experience that I have enemies, visible and invisible, and I know not when, or where, or at what moment, or in what shapes they will attack me. And turning to Sancho, he called for his helmet, and Sancho, as he had no time to take out the curds, had to give it just as it was. Don Quixote took it, and, without perceiving what was in it, thrust it down in hot haste upon his head. But as the curds were pressed and squeezed, the whey began to run all over his face and beard, whereat he was so startled that he cried out to Sancho, "'Sancho, what's this? I think my head is softening, or, or my brains are melting, or, or I'm sweating from head to foot. If I am sweating, it is not indeed from fear. I, I am convinced beyond a doubt that the adventure which is about to befall me is a terrible one. Give me something to wipe myself with, if, if thou hast it, for this profuse sweat is blinding me. Sancho held his tongue, and gave him a cloth, and gave thanks to God at the same time that his master had not found out what was the matter. Don Quixote then wiped himself, and took off his helmet to see what it was that made his head feel so cool, and seeing all that white mash inside his helmet, he put it to his nose, and as soon as he had smelt it, he exclaimed, "'By the life of my lady Dulcinea del Toboso, but it is curds thou hast put there, thou treacherous, impudent, ill-mannered squire!' To which, with great composure and pretended innocence, Sancho replied, "'If they are curds, let me have them, your worship, and I'll eat them.' But let the devil eat them, for it must have been he who put them there. I dare to dirty your helmet? You have guessed the offender finely. Faith, sir, by the light God gives me, it seems I must have enchanters too that persecute me as a creature and limb of your worship, and they must have put that nastiness there in order to provoke your patience to anger and make you baste my ribs as you are wont to do. Well, this time, indeed, they have missed their aim, for I trust to my master's good sense to see that I have got no curds or milk or anything of the sort, and that if I had, it is in my stomach I would put it and not in the helmet. Maybe so, said Don Quixote. All this the gentleman was observing, and with astonishment, 
more especially when, after having wiped himself clean, his head, face, beard, and helmet, Don Quixote put it on, and, settling himself firmly in his stirrups, easing his sword in the scabbard, and grasping his lance, he cried, "'Now come who will, here am I, ready to try conclusions with Satan himself in person.' By this time the cart with the flags had come up, unattended by any one except the carter on a mule, and a man sitting in front. Don Quixote planted himself before it, and said, "'Whither are you going, brothers? What cart is this? What have you got in it? What flags are those?' To this the carter replied, "'The cart is mine. What is in it is a pair of wild-caged lions which the governor of Oran is sending to court as a present to his majesty. And the flags are our lord the king's, to show that what is here is his property.' "'And are the lions large?' asked Don Quixote. "'So large,' replied the man who sat at the door of the cart, "'that larger, or as large, have never crossed from Africa to Spain. "'I am the keeper, and I have brought over others, but never any like these. "'They are male and female. "'The male is in that first cage, and the female in the one behind and they are hungry now, for they have eaten nothing to-day, so let your worship stand aside, for we must make haste to the place where we are to feed them. Hereupon, smiling slightly, Don Quixote exclaimed, Lion whelps! To me! To me whelps of lions! And at such a time! Then, by God, those gentlemen who send them here shall see if I am a man to be frightened by lions! Get down, my good fellow, and as you are the keeper, open the cages, and turn me out those beasts, and in the midst of this plain I will let them know who Don Quixote of La Mancha is, in spite and in the teeth of the enchanters who send them to me. So, so, said the gentleman to himself at this, our worthy knight is shown of what sort he is. The Kurds, no doubt, have softened his skull and brought his brains to a head. At this instant Sancho came up to him, saying, "'Signor, for God's sake, do something to keep my master Don Quixote from tackling these lions, for if he does, they'll tear us all to pieces here.' "'Is your master so mad?' asked the gentleman, "'that you believe and are afraid he will engage such fierce animals?' "'He is not mad,' said Sancho, "'but he is venturesome.' "'I will prevent it,' said the gentleman, and going over to Don Quixote, who was insisting upon the keepers opening the cages, he said to him, "'Sir Knight, knights errant should attempt adventures which encourage the hope of a successful issue, not those which entirely withhold it.' for valour that trenches upon temerity savours rather of madness than of courage moreover these lions do not come to oppose you nor do they dream of such a thing they are going as presents to his majesty and it will not be right to stop them or delay their journey gentle sir replied don quixote you go and mind your tame partridge and your bold ferret and leave every one to manage his own business this is mine, and I know whether these gentlemen, the lions, come to me or not. And then, turning to the keeper, he exclaimed, By all that's good, sir scoundrel, if you don't open the cages this very instant, I'll pin you to the cart with this lance. The carter, seeing the determination of this apparition in armor, said to him, "'Please, your worship, for charity's sake, signor, let me unyoke the mules and place myself in safety along with them before the lions are turned out. For if they kill them on me, I am ruined for life, for all I possess is this cart and mules.' "'O oh, man of little faith,' replied Don Quixote, "'get down and unyoke. You will soon see that you are exerting yourself for nothing, and that you might have spared yourself the trouble.' The carter got down, and with all speed, unyoked the mules, and the keeper called out at the top of his voice, 
I call all here to witness that against my will and under compulsion I opened the cages and let the lions loose, and that I warn this gentleman that he will be accountable for all the harm and mischief which these beasts may do, and for my salary and dues as well. You, gentlemen, place yourselves in safety before I open, for I know they will do me no harm. Once more the gentleman strove to persuade Don Quixote not to do such a mad thing, as it was tempting God to engage in such a piece of folly. To this Don Quixote replied that he knew what he was about. The gentleman in return entreated him to reflect, for he knew he was under a delusion. "'Well, senor,' answered Don Quixote, "'if you do not like to be a spectator of this tragedy, "'as in your opinion it will be, "'spur your flea-bitten mare and place yourself in safety.' Hearing this, Sancho, with tears in his eyes, entreated him to give up an enterprise compared with which the one of the windmills, and the awful one of the fulling mills, and in fact all the feats he had attempted in the whole course of his life, were cakes and fancy bread. "'Look ye, senor,' said Sancho, "'there's no enchantment here, nor anything of the sort. For between the bars and chinks of the cage I have seen the paw of a real lion, and judging by that I reckon the lion such a paw could belong to must be bigger than a mountain.' "'Fear, at any rate,' replied Don Quixote, "'will make him look bigger to thee than half the world.' "'Retire, Sancho, and leave me, and if I die here, thou knowest our old compact. Thou wilt repair to Dulcinea. I say no more.' To these he added some further words that banished all hope of his giving up his insane project. He of the green gaban would have offered resistance, but he found himself ill-matched as to arms, and did not think it prudent to come to blows with a madman, for such Don Quixote now showed himself to be in every respect. And the latter, renewing his commands to the keeper and repeating his threats, gave warning to the gentleman to spur his mare, Sancho his dapple, and the carter his mules, all striving to get away from the cart as far as they could before the lions broke loose. Sancho was weeping over his master's death, for this time he firmly believed it was in store for him from the claws of the lions, and he cursed his fate, and called it an unlucky hour when he thought of taking service with him again. But with all his tears and lamentations, he did not forget to thrash Dapple so as to put a good space between himself and the cart. The keeper, seeing that the fugitives were now some distance off, once more entreated and warned him as before. But he replied that he heard him, and that he need not trouble himself with any further warnings or entreaties, as they would be fruitless, and bade him make haste. During the delay that occurred while the keeper was opening the first cage, Don Quixote was considering whether it would not be well to do battle on foot, instead of on horseback, and finally resolved to fight on foot, fearing that Rocinante might take fright at the sight of the lions. He therefore sprang off his horse, flung his lance aside, braced his buckler on his arm, and drawing his sword, advanced slowly with marvellous intrepidity and resolute courage to plant himself in front of the cart, commending himself with all his heart to God and to his lady Dulcinea. It is to be observed that on coming to this passage, the author of this veracious history breaks out into exclamations. O oh, doughty Don Quixote, high-mettled past extolling, mirror wherein all the heroes of the world may see themselves, second modern Don Manuel de Leon, once the glory and honor of Spanish knighthood. In what words shall I describe this dread exploit? By what language shall I make it credible to ages to come? What eulogies are there unmeet for thee, though they be hyperboles piled upon hyperboles? On foot, alone, undaunted, high-souled, with but a simple sword, and that no trenchant blade of the Parillo brand, a shield, but no bright polished steel one, there stoodst thou, biding and awaiting the two fiercest lions that Africa's forests ever bred, 
thy own deeds be thy praise, valiant Van Chigan, and here I leave them as they stand, wanting the words wherewith to glorify them. Here the author's outburst came to an end, and he proceeded to take up the thread of his story, saying that the keeper, seeing that Don Quixote had taken up his position, and that it was impossible for him to avoid letting out the mail without incurring the enmity of the fiery and daring knight, flung open the doors of the first cage containing, as has been said, the lion, which was now seen to be of enormous size and grim and hideous mien. The first thing he did was to turn round in the cage in which he lay, and protrude his claws, and stretch himself thoroughly. He next opened his mouth, and yawned very leisurely, and with near two palms' length of tongue that he had thrust forth, he licked the dust out of his eyes and washed his face. Having done this, he put his head out of the cage and looked all round with eyes like glowing coals, a spectacle and demeanour to strike terror into temerity itself. Don Quixote merely observed him steadily, longing for him to leap from the cart and come to close quarters with him when he hoped to hew him in pieces. So far did his unparalleled madness go, but the noble lion, more courteous than arrogant, not troubling himself about silly bravado, after having looked around, as has been said, turned about, and presented his hind-quarters to Don Quixote, and very coolly and tranquilly lay down again in the cage. Seeing this, Don Quixote ordered the keeper to take a stick to him and provoke him to make him come out. "'That I won't,' said the keeper, "'for if I anger him, the first he'll tear in pieces will be myself. Be satisfied, Sir Knight, with what you have done which leaves nothing more to be said on the score of courage, and do not seek to tempt fortune a second time. The lion has the door open. He is free to come out or not to come out. But as he has not come out so far, he will not come out to-day. Your worship's great courage has been fully manifested already. No brave champion, so it strikes me, is bound to do more than challenge his enemy and wait for him on the field. If his adversary does not come, on him lies the disgrace, and he who waits for him carries off the crown of victory. That is true, said Don Quixote. Close the door, my friend, and let me have, in the best form thou canst, what thou hast seen me do, by way of certificate, to it, that thou didst open for the lion, that I waited for him, that he did not come out, that I still waited for him, and that still he did not come out, and lay down again. I am not bound to do more. Enchantments avaunt, and God uphold the right, the truth, and true chivalry. Close the door as I bade thee, while I make signals to the fugitives that have left us, that they may learn this exploit from thy lips. The keeper obeyed, and Don Quixote, fixing on the point of his lance the cloth he had wiped his face with after the deluge of curds, proceeded to recall the others, who still continued to fly, looking back at every step, all in a body, the gentleman bringing up the rear. Sancho, however, happening to observe the signal of the white cloth, exclaimed, "'May I die if my master has not overcome the wild beasts, for he is calling to us!' They all stopped, and perceived that it was Don Quixote who was making signals, and shaking off their fears to some extent, they approached slowly, until they were near enough to hear distinctly Don Quixote's voice calling to them. They returned at length to the cart, and as they came up, Don Quixote said to the carter, Put your mules to once more, brother, and continue your journey, and do thou, Sancho, give him two gold crowns for himself and the keeper, to compensate for the delay they have incurred through me. That will I give with all my heart, said Sancho, but what has become of the lions? Are they dead or alive? The keeper then, in full detail and bit by bit, described the end of the contest, exalting to the best of his power and ability the valour of Don Quixote, 
at the sight of whom the lion quailed, and would not and dared not come out of the cage, although he had held the door open ever so long, and showing how, in consequence of his having represented to the knight that it was tempting God to provoke the lion in order to force him out, which he wished to have done, he very reluctantly, and altogether against his will, had allowed the door to be closed. "'What dost thou think of this, Sancho?' said Don Quixote. "'Are there any enchantments that can prevail against true valour? The enchanters may be able to rob me of good fortune, but of fortitude and courage they cannot.' Uh, Sancho paid the crowns, the carter put to, the keeper kissed Don Quixote's hands for the bounty bestowed upon him, and promised to give an account of the valiant exploit to the king himself as soon as he saw him at court. Then said Don Quixote. If his majesty should happen to ask who performed it, you must say, The Knight of the Lions, for it is my desire that into this the name I have hitherto borne of Knight of the Rueful Countenance be from this time forward changed, altered, transformed, and turned, and in this I follow the ancient usage of knights-errant, who change their names when they pleased, or when it suited their purpose." The cart went its way, and Don Quixote, Sancho, and he of the Green Gabon went theirs. All this time Don Diego de Miranda had not spoken a word, being entirely taken up with observing and noting all that Don Quixote did and said, and the opinion he formed was that he was a man of brains gone mad, and a madman on the verge of rationality. The first part of his history had not yet reached him, for— had he read it, the amazement with which his words and deeds filled him would have vanished, as he would then have understood the nature of his madness. But knowing nothing of it, he took him to be rational one moment, and crazy the next, for what he said was sensible, elegant, and well expressed, and what he did, absurd, rash, and foolish. And he said to himself, what could be madder than putting on a helmet full of curds, and then persuading oneself that enchanters are softening one's skull? Or what could be greater rashness and folly than wanting to fight lions tooth and nail? Don Quixote roused him from these reflections and this soliloquy by saying, No doubt, Signor Don Diego de Miranda, you set me down in your mind as a fool and a madman, and it would be no wonder if you did, for my deeds do not argue anything else. But, for all that, I would have you take notice that I am neither so mad nor so foolish as I must have seemed to you. A gallant knight shows to advantage bringing his lance to bear adroitly upon a fierce bull under the eyes of his sovereign, in the midst of a spacious plaza. A knight shows to advantage, arrayed in glittering armour, pacing the lists before the ladies in some joyous tournament, and all those knights show to advantage that entertain, divert, and, if we may say so, honour the courts of their princes by warlike exercises, or what resemble them. But to greater advantage than all these does a knight-errant show when he traverses deserts, solitudes, cross-roads, forests, and mountains, in quest of perilous adventures, bent on bringing them to a happy and successful issue, all to win a glorious and lasting renown. To greater advantage, I maintain, does the knight-errant show bringing aid to some widow in some lonely waste, than the court knight dallying with some city damsel. All knights have their own special parts to play. Let the courier devote himself to the ladies. Let him add luster to his sovereign's court by his liveries. Let him entertain poor gentlemen with the sumptuous fare of his table. Let him arrange joustings, martial tournaments, and prove himself noble, generous, and magnificent, and above all a good Christian, and, so doing, he will fulfil the duties that are especially his. But let the knight-errant explore the corners of the earth, and penetrate the most intricate labyrinths. At each step let him attempt impossibilities, on desolate heaths let him endure the burning rays of the midsummer sun, and the bitter inclemency of the winter winds and frosts. 
Let no lions daunt him, nor monsters terrify him, no dragons make him quail. For to seek these, to attack those, and to vanquish all, are in truth his main duties. I, then, as it has fallen to my lot to be a member of knight-errantry, cannot avoid attempting all that to me seems to come within the sphere of my duties. Thus it was my bounden duty to attack those lions that I just now attacked, although I knew it to be the height of rashness. For I know well what valor is, that it is a virtue that occupies a place between two vicious extremes, cowardice and temerity. But it will be a lesser evil for him who is valiant to rise till he reaches the point of rashness than to sink until he reaches the point of cowardice. For as it is easier for the prodigal than for the miser to become generous, so it is easier for a rash man to prove truly valiant than for a coward to rise to true valor. And believe me, Signor Don Diego, in attempting adventures, it is better to lose by a card too many than by a card too few, for to hear it said, such a knight is rash and daring, sounds better than such a knight is timid and cowardly. I protest, Signor Don Quixote, said Don Diego, everything you have said and done is proved correct by the test of reason itself and i believe if the laws and ordinances of knight-errantry should be lost they might be found in your worship's breast as in their own proper depository and monument house but let us make haste and reach my village where you shall take rest after your late exertions for if they have not been of the body they have been of the spirit and these sometimes tend to produce bodily fatigue I take the invitation as a great favor and honor, Signor Don Diego, replied Don Quixote, and pressing forward at a better pace than before, at about two in the afternoon they reached the village and house of Don Diego, or as Don Quixote called him, the Knight of the Green Gabon. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 Of what happened Don Quixote in the castle or house of the Knight of the Green Gabon, together with other matters out of the common. Don Quixote found Don Diego de Miranda's house built in village style, with his arms in rough stone over the street door. In the patio was the storeroom, and at the entrance the cellar, with plenty of wine-jars standing round, which, coming from El Toboso, brought back to his memory his enchanted and transformed Dulcinea and with a sigh and not thinking of what he was saying or in whose presence he was he exclaimed o oh, ye sweet treasures to my sorrow found once sweet and welcome when twas heaven's good will o oh, ye to boatswain jars how ye bring back to my memory the sweet object of my bitter regrets the student poet don diego's son who had come out with his mother to receive him heard this exclamation, and both mother and son were filled with amazement at the extraordinary figure he presented. He, however, dismounting from Rocinante, advanced with great politeness to ask permission to kiss the lady's hand, while Don Diego said, "'Signora, pray receive with your wonted kindness Signor Don Quixote of La Mancha, whom you see before you, a knight-errant, and the bravest and wisest in the world. The lady, whose name was Dona Cristina, received him with every sign of goodwill and great courtesy, and Don Quixote placed himself at her service with an abundance of well-chosen and polished phrases. Almost the same civilities were exchanged between him and the student, who, listening to Don Quixote, took him to be a sensible, clear-headed person. Here the author describes minutely everything belonging to Don Diego's mansion, putting before us in his picture the whole contents of a rich gentleman farmer's house. But the translator of the history thought it best to pass over these and other details of the same sort in silence, as they are not in harmony with the main purpose of the story, the strong point of which is truth rather than dull digressions. They led Don Quixote into a room, 
and Sancho removed his armor, leaving him in loose walloon breeches and chamois leather doublet, all stained with the rust of his armor. His collar was a falling one of scholastic cut, without starch or lace, his buskins buff-colored, and his shoes polished. He wore his good sword, which hung in a baldric of sea-wolf skin, for he had suffered for many years, they say, from an ailment of the kidneys, and over all he threw a long cloak of good gray cloth. But first of all, with five or six buckets of water, for as regard the number of buckets there is some dispute, he washed his head and face, and still the water remained whey-colored, thanks to Sancho's greediness and purchase of those unlucky curds that turned his master so white. Thus arrayed, and with an easy, sprightly, and gallant air, Don Quixote passed out into another room, where the student was waiting to entertain him while the table was being laid, for on the arrival of so distinguished a guest, Dona Cristina was anxious to show that she knew how, and was able to give, a becoming reception to those who came to her house. While Don Quixote was taking off his armor, Don Lorenzo, for so Don Diego's son was called, took the opportunity to say to his father, "'What are we to make of this gentleman you have brought home to us, sir? For his name, his appearance, and your describing him as a knight-errant, have completely puzzled my mother and me.' "'I don't know what to say, my son,' replied Don Diego. "'All I can tell thee is that I have seen him act the acts of the greatest madman in the world.' and heard him make observations so sensible that they efface and undo all he does. Do thou talk to him, and feel the pulse of his wits, and, as thou art shrewd, form the most reasonable conclusion thou canst as to his wisdom or folly, though, to tell the truth, I am more inclined to take him to be mad than sane. With this, Don Lorenzo, went away to entertain Don Quixote, as has been said, and in the course of the conversation that passed between them, Don Quixote said to Don Lorenzo, "'Your father, Señor Don Diego de Miranda, has told me of the rare abilities and subtle intellect you possess, and, above all, that you are a great poet.' "'A poet it may be,' replied Don Lorenzo, "'but a great one by no means. It is true that I am somewhat given to poetry.' and to reading good poets, but not so much so as to justify the title of great which my father gives me. <laughs> I do not dislike that modesty, said Don Quixote, for there is no poet who is not conceited, and does not think he is the best poet in the world. There is no rule without an exception, said Don Lorenzo. There may be some who are poets, and yet do not think they are. Very few, said Don Quixote. But tell me, what verses are those which you have now in hand, and which your father tells me keep you somewhat restless and absorbed? If it be some gloss, I know something about glosses, and I should like to hear them. And if they are for a poetical tournament, contrive to carry off the second prize, for the first always goes by favor or personal standing, the second by simple justice, and so the third comes to be the second, and the first, reckoning in this way, will be third, in the same way as licentiate degrees are conferred at the universities. But, for all that, the title of first is a great distinction. So far, said Don Lorenzo to himself, I should not take you to be a madman, but let us go on. So he said to him, your worship has apparently attended the schools. What sciences have you studied? That of knight-errantry, said Don Quixote, which is as good as that of poetry, and even a finger or two above it. I do not know what science that is, said Don Lorenzo, and until now I have never heard of it. It is a science, said Don Quixote, that comprehends in itself all or most of the sciences in the world, for he who professes it must be a jurist, and must know the rules of justice, distributive and equitable, so as to give to each one what belongs to him and is due to him. He must be a theologian, so as to be able to give a clear and distinctive reason for the Christian faith he professes, wherever it may be asked of him. He must be a physician, 
and, above all, a herbalist, so as in wastes and solitudes to know the herbs that have the property of healing wounds, for a knight-errant must not go looking for someone to cure him at every step. He must be an astronomer, so as to know by the stars how many hours of the night have passed, and what clime and quarter of the world he is in. He must know mathematics, for at every turn some occasion for them will present itself to him, and putting it aside that he must be adorned with all the virtues, cardinal and theological, to come down to minor particulars, he must, I say, be able to swim as well as Nicholas or Nicolao, the fish could, as the story goes. He must know how to chew a horse, and repair his saddle and bridle, and, to return to higher matters, he must be faithful to God and to his lady. He must be pure in thought, decorous in words, generous in works, valiant in deeds, patient in suffering, compassionate towards the needy, and lastly, an upholder of the truth, though its defence should cost him his life. Of all these qualities, great and small, is a true knight-errant made up. Judge, then, Signor Don Lorenzo, whether it be a contemptible science which the knight who studies and professes it has to learn, and whether it may not compare with the very loftiest that are taught in the schools. If that be so, replied Don Lorenzo, this science, I protest, surpasses all. How, if that be so? said Don Quixote. What I mean to say, said Don Lorenzo, is that I doubt whether there are now, or ever were, any knights errant, and adorned with such virtues. Many a time, replied Don Quixote, have I said what I now say once more that the majority of the world are of opinion that there never were any knights errant in it. And as it is my opinion that, unless heaven by some miracle brings home to them the truth that there were and are, all the pains one takes will be in vain, as experience has often proved to me. I will not now stop to disabuse you of the error you share with the multitude. All I shall do is to pray to heaven to deliver you from it and to show you how beneficial and necessary knights-errant were in days of yore, and how useful they would be in these days were they but in vogue. But now, for the sins of the people, sloth and indolence, gluttony and luxury, are triumphant. Our guest is broken out on our hands, said Don Lorenzo to himself at this point, but for all that, he is a glorious madman, and— I should be a dull blockhead to doubt it. Here, being summoned to dinner, they brought their colloquy to a close. Don Diego asked his son what he had been able to make out as to the wits of their guest, to which he replied, All the doctors and clever scribes in the world will not make sense of the scrawl of his madness. He is a madman full of streaks, full of lucid intervals. They went in to dinner, and the repast was such as Don Diego said on the road he was in the habit of giving to his guests, neat, plentiful, and tasty. But what pleased Don Quixote most was the marvellous silence that reigned throughout the house, for it was like a Carthusian monastery. When the cloth had been removed, Grace said, and their hands washed, Don Quixote earnestly pressed Don Lorenzo to repeat to him his verses for the poetical tournament, to which he replied, Not to be like those poets who, when they are asked to recite their verses, refuse, and when they are not asked for them, vomit them up. I will repeat my gloss, for which I do not expect any prize, having composed it merely as an exercise of ingenuity. A discerning friend of mine— said Don Quixote, was of opinion that no one ought to waste labor in glossing verses, and the reason he gave was that the gloss can never come up to the text, and that often, or most frequently, it wanders away from the meaning and purpose aimed at the glossed lines, and besides, that the laws of the gloss were too strict, as they did not allow interrogations, nor said he, nor I say, nor turning verbs into nouns, or altering the construction, not to speak of other restrictions and limitations that fetter gloss-writers, as you no doubt know. Verily, Signor Don Quixote, said Don Lorenzo, 
I wish I could catch your worship tripping at a stretch, but I cannot, for you slip through my fingers like an eel. I don't understand what you say or mean by slipping, said Don Quixote. I will explain myself another time, said Don Lorenzo, for the present pray attend to the glossed verses and the gloss, which run thus. Could was become an is for me, then would I ask no more than this, or could for me the time that is become the time that is to be. Gloss Dame Fortune once upon a day to me was bountiful and kind, but all things change. She changed her mind, and what she gave she took away. O oh, fortune, long I've sued to thee, the gifts thou gavest me restore, for, trust me, I would ask no more, could was become an is for me. No other prize I seek to gain, no triumph, glory, or success, only the long-lost happiness, the memory whereof is pain. One taste, methinks, of bygone bliss the heart-consuming fire might stay, and, so it come without delay, then would I ask no more than this. I asked what cannot be, alas, that time should ever be, and then come back to us and be again. No power on earth can bring to pass. For fleet of foot is he, I wis, and idly, therefore, do we pray that for a hath left us may become for us the time that is perplexed uncertain to remain twixt hope and fear is death not life twere better sure to end the strife and dying seek release from pain and yet thought were the best for me Anon the thought aside I fling, and to the present fondly cling, and dread the time that is to be. When Don Lorenzo had finished reciting his gloss, Don Quixote stood up, and in a loud voice, almost a shout, exclaimed as he grasped Don Lorenzo's right hand in his, By the highest heavens, noble youth, but you are the best poet on earth, and deserve to be crowned with laurel not by Cyprus or by Gaeta, as a certain poet, God forgive him, said, but by the academies of Athens, if they still flourished, and by those that flourish now, Paris, Bologna, Salamanca. Heaven grant that the judges who rob you of the first prize, that Phoebus may pierce them with his arrows, and the muses never cross the thresholds of their doors. Repeat me some of your long-measure verses, signor, if you will be so good, for I want thoroughly to feel the pulse of your rare genius. Is there any need to say that Don Lorenzo enjoyed hearing himself praised by Don Quixote, albeit he looked upon him as a madman? Power of flattery, how far-reaching art thou, and how wide are the bounds of thy pleasant jurisdiction? Don Lorenzo gave a proof of it for he complied with Don Quixote's request and entreaty, and repeated to him this sonnet on the fable or story of Pyramus and Thisbe. Sonnet The lovely maid, she pierces now the wall, heart pierced by her young Pyramus doth lie, and love spreads wing from Cyprus isle to fly, a chink to view so wondrous great and small. There silence speaketh, for no voice at all can pass so straight a strait, but love will ply, where to all other power twere vain to try. For love will find a way whate'er befall. Impatient of delay, with reckless pace the rash maid wins the fatal spot where she sinks not in lover's arms, but death's embrace. So runs the strange tale, how the lovers twain, one sword, one sepulchre, one memory, slays, and entombs, and brings to life again. Blessed be God, 
said Don Quixote, when he had heard Don Lorenzo's sonnet, that among the hosts there are of irritable poets, I have found one consummate one, which, Signor, the art of this sonnet proves to me that you are. For four days was Don Quixote most sumptuously entertained in Don Diego's house, at the end of which time he asked his permission to depart, telling him he thanked him for the kindness and hospitality he had received in his house, but that, as it did not become knights-errant to give themselves up for long to idleness and luxury, he was anxious to fulfill the duties of his calling in seeking adventures, of which he was informed there was an abundance in that neighborhood, where he hoped to employ his time until the day came round for the joust at Saragossa, for that was his proper destination, and that, first of all, he meant to enter the cave of Montesinos, of which so many marvellous things were reported all through the country, and at the same time to investigate and explore the origin and true source of the seven lakes commonly called the Lakes of Ruidera. Don Diego and his son commended his laudable resolution, and bade him furnish himself with all he wanted from their house and belongings, as they would most gladly be of service to him which, indeed, his personal worth and his honourable profession made incumbent upon them. The day of his departure came at length, as welcome to Don Quixote as it was sad and sorrowful to Sancho Panza, who was very well satisfied with the abundance of Don Diego's house, and objected to return to the starvation of the woods and wilds and the short commons of his ill-stocked alforjas. These, however, he filled and packed with what he considered needful. On taking leave, Don Quixote said to Don Lorenzo, I know not whether I have told you already, but if I have, I tell you once more that if you wish to spare yourself fatigue and toil in reaching the inaccessible summit of the Temple of Fame, you have nothing to do but to turn aside out of the somewhat narrow path of poetry, and take the still narrower one of knight-errantry, wide enough, however, to make you an emperor in the twinkling of an eye. In this speech Don Quixote wound up the evidence of his madness, but still better in what he added when he said, God knows I would gladly take Don Lorenzo with me to teach him how to spare the humble and trample the proud underfoot, virtues that are part and parcel of the profession I belong to. But since his tender age does not allow of it, nor his praiseworthy pursuits permit it, I will simply content myself with impressing it upon your worship that you will become famous as a poet if you are guided by the opinion of others rather than by your own, because no fathers or mothers ever think their own children ill-favoured, and this sort of deception prevails still more strongly in the case of the children of the brain. Both father and son were amazed afresh at the strange bedly Don Quixote talked, at one moment's sense, at another nonsense, and at the pertinacity and persistence he displayed, and going through thick and thin in quest of his unlucky adventures, which he made the end and aim of his desires. There was a renewal of offers of service and civilities, and then, with the gracious permission of the lady of the castle, they took their departure. Don Quixote on Rocinante, and Sancho on Dapple. End of chapter 18. Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois.